for joining me for the Plant Yourself Podcast. I'm your host, Howie Jacobson. Today's conversation is about art and activism and media literacy and racial justice and messing with the system and having fun. The person I'm talking to is Keith Knight. He is the creator, the head writer, and the subject of the amazingly hilarious and hard-hitting uh, Hulu series Woke, uh, which just got renewed for a second season, which is coming out on April 8th, 2022. I met him through my daughter, Yael, who is also part of this conversation. So if you go to the show notes at plantyourself.com slash 504, you'll be able to see some of those great photos. And Keith is hilarious and he is wise. And we talked about a whole host of issues, including his initiative, Black Mugshots. So I won't say more about it now, but if you go to blackmugshots.com, you'll see what he's about. And so in our conversation, we talked about what it's like to um, represent your life on a, a television uh, dramedy, comedy drama. Um, how Keith thinks about America and race and what's important and just all about sort of creativity and having fun and making a difference in a pretty complicated world. I hope you enjoy it. The other thing is that when we started, instead of me doing the usual, whoa, Keith Knight, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast, he encouraged me, just turn it, hit the record button and let's just start talking. So it feel like it really opened me up to kind of higher levels of casual conversation and creativity. And it was just a lot of fun. Now for audio, it's important to know we were in person, we were sitting outside at a coffee shop in Carborough, North Carolina. So there is ambience, there is bird song and cars going by and, and snippets of other conversation. But I made sure that everything that's important is eminently hearable. So here we go. Yeah. All right, well, we're already in the conversation. So my first question is, should I call you Keith or Keith? Keith. Uh, Keith is sort of my nickname, but now that it's a different, you know, now that there's a character named Keith, it's like, it's much easier to differentiate, okay. but I still sign my name Keith all the time. Cause it's just easier to type. You uh -huh. know? So, okay. I mean, I could have gotten away with being ambiguous about it. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and the reason why Keith became my nickname was like there were these two Haitian brothers in my uh, college dormitory that couldn't pronounce TH so they would get they would be all like Keith Keith all the time so oh okay I, sp I spent a, a year in Israel so my name should be Avi ah they couldn't do the H or the W oh okay <laughs> so uh Keith Knight Welcome to the Plant Yourself Podcast. I'm so happy to be talking to you. Yeah, I'm so happy to be out on a sunny day when it's pleasant outside, not freezing. Yeah, so hope, hopefully the uh, the ambient noise won't won't detract from the, from the clarity. I I love that stuff because it puts you in a place. So I like that. Mm. All right, I I feel like you've upped my podcast game twice now. <laughs> so we just started talking, and we're in a place. Yeah, yeah. It's uh it's I don't know. I I I love I love the town. I love the community of Carborough, so um it's nice to be out amongst people and yeah. see faces. Yep. Yep. I've been doing this podcast virtually and remotely for a long time, so I know. We did the whole season 2. Um we wrote season 2 on Zoom, which in some ways, it's great because I didn't have to go to Los Angeles and write it. I wrote mm. season, season one and flew back like every two weeks to visit my family. So it was nice to just get an office and do it from here. And um, I think I think it's going to be the future of it because certainly the production companies save all this money instead of having a, an office building in downtown Los Angeles. Like, let's just zoom in and, and mm. get this stuff done. So Yeah, I wonder if there's more room for... Or out of the box ideas, if you're not like in a writer's room where one personality is uh, dominating. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's a combination of, of the two. I think I think there should be a, a point where everyone does get to meet, so we just get to know each other's, you know, a little bit, of like idiosyncrasies and stuff like that. But then we all go and so a combination of the two, I think, would be really good. 
And mm-hmm. and you're right. Like there's there's some bit of of um, chemistry that happens when people are together. So I think that needs to establish. But there's also um, it's also nice to just be able to sit in a room and <laughs> you have to go to the bathroom. I gotta go to the bathroom. Just <laughs> flick off and go to the bathroom. So. <laughs> Nice. So, so let's uh, let's back up and talk about what we're what we're talking oh, about. Oh yeah, yes. Okay. So the the show is called Woke. It's, yes. It's on it's on Hulu. Yes. And you just announced seasons two air date, right? Season two's air date April eighth, two thousand twenty two, and uh, yeah, just announced it yesterday. So, really, this is the first time I'm actually talking about it. So it's sort of a big scoop, mm. you know. Excellent. I'm, I'm, you hear that? <laughs> I, I got the scoop today. Cutting edge, cutting edge. <laughs> so, and, uh, and we're joined uh, on the sidelines by my daughter, Yael, who's taking the photos. And you're going to occasionally be to make some noise, right? I wanted to. I'm just, I just want to know what's, what can you tell us about season two? No, no, no. no. We're going <laughs> to. We'll, we might get there, but we have to do it gently. Okay. Yeah. Um, so first, I just want to ask you about about you. So you've been a cartoonist for a long time. For a long time, I'd say close to thirty years now. A professional cartoonist, like uh, thirty years, <laughs> it's kind of insane. But um, it's it's something I have always wanted to do, and and it's there is no no one right way to do it. And I think if you ask twenty different cartoonists how they earned a living as a cartoonist, they would give you 20 different answers, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh... Well, like, half the boys in my school when I was a kid, you know, were cartoonists, right? Like, that was the thing that a bunch of them did. They would draw superheroes or, or, or comic strips. None of us thought that it was a career. <laughs> yeah, well, that's... I mean, it... it honestly, it really isn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... Yeah, it's... It's one of those things where... I was just lucky enough to get encouraged by the right people and um, uh, and just figured it out. It was like I had some really amazing teachers, two amazing teachers, and, and one was uh, an English teacher when I was a junior in high school. And he assigned us um, Animal Farm to read, um, George Orwell. And it was truly the first book that I've ever read from front to back in school that I was assigned and um and it, <laughs> it's it's mainly because I just couldn't I never could relate to any of the other books and and this is something to be said about about the books that kids are in, assigned in school <laughs> um I got more books where there were the pro- protagonists were animals than people of color. So like huh. I could never I felt like I could never relate to any of the books until Animal Farm came around. It was like, "Oh, the animals take over the farm and kick out the farmers." So I said to my uh English teacher, I he, we had to do a book report and I said I can't do justice to this unless I can do a book re- a comic book report. Can I do a comic book report? He said, "Sure." So what I did was do a parody of Animal Farm. So instead of uh, animals and farmers on a farm, I did students and teachers in my high school. <laughs> and uh, so it was me. I was the head student, the head pig, Napoleon. And uh, all my friends and everybody else were um, the rest of the farm animals. And the teachers, obviously, were the farmers. And I had rules like under 18 good over 18 bad you know stuff like that and i did caricatures of all the teachers and was making fun of everybody and my my english teacher was so psyched about it that he kept it in in the teacher's lounge a little bit longer (laughs) to show all the teachers and uh and when he returned it back to me he wrote a plus plus you capture the essence of animal farm perfectly but more importantly, you should be doing a syndicated comic strip. Huh. So that was the first time I'd ever heard syndicate, you know? Uh-huh. And uh, and so that is what really led me to the local newspaper because I started to read syndicate along the side of each comic strip. And I went to the local paper and they explained what a syndicate was and sort of that set me on my way to... I'm going to do a daily comic strip. So I did it for my high school paper, my college newspaper, 
and then moved to San Francisco and 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 things changed. <laughs> changed a lot. Mm-hmm. So um you grew, you grew up in Massachusetts, right? I was up yeah, I grew up in Malden, Massachusetts. Um home of Jack Albertson from Chico and the Man and and Willy Wonka and um also Killer Kowalski. He had a wrestling school up there. <laughs> And um, and a couple of uh, Stephen King's uh, horror stories okay. have partly taken place in Malden. Oh, also home to Converse All Stars. That's where Converse All Stars were invented. No kidding. Okay. Yes. I just saw your uh, your late, your strip on uh, new shoes. Yes. Yes. My my new shoes. <laughs> so not first time. Not Converse. Huh? It's insane. Like. For the first time, my back doesn't hurt. It, like, stopped hurting because I have decent shoes on. This is really, really kind of sad <laughs> that I realized that in my 50s, I've been wearing the wrong shoes all my life. So, uh, shout out to Allbirds. They're expensive, but they're good. Mm. That's the, That should be their tagline. We're expensive, <laughs> but we're good. The, you know, Chucks are... Uh iconic though like I, you have to give up a little comfort for yeah yeah i uh, know that's true that's true they're they're the um doc martens of sneakers <laughs> <laughs> they've also gotten expensive oh compared to like when they were the, you know 25 dollar well, pairs when i was a kid. it is well here's the great thing about growing up in the place where they invented them there used to be a factory um in our town and before people realized that they could sell irregulars for less money, they used to just dump them into a, a dumpster huh. next to the thing. So we would dumpster dive and just pull out. It would just be stitching that's off or, you know, just something that's a little bit wrong. And, and we would do that there and at New Balance. Actually, New Balance was... Uh, my buddy was really into New Balance, so he took me to Cambridge to, to dumpster dive there. But uh, I was... Mm. I should probably if I should probably should have went with New Balance because my my back would be a lot better right now. But I don't know. Anyway, the reason I was asking about that when you were talking about you know Animal House, uh, Animal Farm. Sorry, <laughs> wrong move. Uh, and, that's a whole whole farm. nother a whole nother thing. <laughs> yeah. And and you know being able to relate to it because there were no books. Uh, for people who looked like you were, was it predominantly white school? Oh neighborhood? yeah, well. It's funny because Malden is known as the most diverse town in Massachusetts. And so, you know, I grew up, I grew up in the black section of, of, of uh, Malden. So it wasn't like, you know, I was surrounded by white people. Although I, I, when my sister and I went to, we went to a, a school from fourth grade to sixth grade called the Major Works Program. And... <laughs> It was supposed to be the smartest kids in the city that go there. And my mom just revealed to me that um, I didn't go because I was the smartest. (laughs) It was my twin sister who was really smart. And they thought that she'd be better off if her twin brother was there with her. And we were the only black kids at that school. But, um, but yeah, it was interesting because that school was we it wasn't a normal school it was like we did plays and puppet shows like did presentations it was a whole different thing and i wish schools remain that way like or or the rest of my time because we went back into the school system at in seventh grade and it was just back to regular school again and it was just like oh Mm -hmm. this is not good but I carried that creativity into seventh grade and I was drawing comics all the time and, and sort of became known as the comic, the uh-huh. comics guy. But yeah, my mom revealed to me that I'm not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. So you were the wingman. <laughs> I was the wingman. <laughs> well, and one of the reasons I'm interested in this is, you know, the, uh, it's not a spoiler, like the premise of, of Woke is in the the title and mm. you know you get it the first 10 minutes of the first episode is it's it's about a fictionalized version of of you i don't know how fictionalized yet but it's someone who um is a, trying to be a mainstream cartoonist, cartoonist. Yeah. and you know there's all these references you know to, to your you and your roommates are talking about jar jar binks um you have a um 
there was a, a cartoon on your uh, on your website that I saw. I'm not. I'm blanking on the name, but it was like this British TV show that you really liked as a kid. Oh yeah, yeah, the young ones. Yeah. The young ones. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm curious about like the seems to be like a tension between like you just liking sort of nerd culture, which is largely white culture, and then becoming woke. And your you know your work is so overtly political and. Um, racially informed i'm I'm curious about the well i I will say this that black people are the biggest nerds and and that's you know maybe it doesn't seem to (laughs) it doesn't seem that way but every rapper that's ever existed are into superheroes because being a, a, a hip hop artist is like being a superhero. You got your regular persona and you got your rap persona. You got the name. You got you boast about how great or strong or rich or whatever. Like it's it it really is very similar to it. And I don't know. I just grew up in a place where you know my friend's older brother was had like a Led Zeppelin painting on the wall and you know and the you know black people are you know into <laughs> other things other than what you see on TV and so it was important for me with the show to show that like that it's perfectly normal that uh being into not only hip hop, but being into punk music, being into British comedy, bring in, being into all this different stuff. So, uh, I think my wife said it best, and my wife is German. She said, "You know, uh, when I met you and your family and your friends and all that stuff, she's like, the first, you know, the, one of the first things I thought about was like, black people, you know." talk way differently in person than they do on TV. (laughs) And, you know, and the point is who these images of black folks on TV, who are the gatekeepers to that? Mm. And it's white people. Like, white people have a particular image or idea of what black is. And they allow that to be on TV. And so, it's important, it was important for me to have a show that showed different aspects of it. So that's why there's Keith and then Clovis is like his yang to, to Keith's yin, you know? So um, it, it was important to celebrate all the types of music that mm. black folks make, you know? Because, and I say this during my presentations, if it wasn't for black people, all the music on the radio would sound like all that stuff you hear at a Renaissance fair, you know? <laughs> do, 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 do. Like, and I, I honestly don't understand why schools, public schools, don't teach just music and sort of his, historically in this country because that's one of our biggest ex- exports. I will say hip hop, rock and roll is, um, uh, you know, Music is a, one of America's biggest exports, and it's it's essentially it's a black creation, and we should be celebrating that. But you know, mm-hmm. folks are trying to prevent it from being things from being taught. You know, <laughs> it's <laughs> like essentially the blues are talking about how tough and bad your life is. Well, you know, we don't want to teach that because it sounds like you know. Sounds like CRT, yeah, stuff like that. It's <laughs> silly. It's silly. But that, the, you know, that's, it was important to me to do that. It's important to me to show, and I, I, and the same thing with my comics. When I first started the K Chronicles, which is my autobiographical comic that I've been doing for like 30 years, I just remember that I created it because I was a hip hop fan in the 80s and we would spin it on our college radio station and our college music director would say don't do that don't spin that you know like and we're like why and 
you know, it's like they, they're so excited to spin punk music and new wave and stuff because it's independent and it's raw and it's this. What's more raw than than, than so, golden age, late 80s hip hop, you know? So what were, what were some of the albums and artists? I mean, everything from Public Enemy to Tribe Called Quest to uh, NWA to like a, a lot mm-hmm. of just Schooly D back in the day, KRS-One. Um, De La Soul. We were spinning all this great stuff, and you know, we eventually got kicked off the air. <laughs> so but. was was it just? Were they, I mean, were they listening to the lyrics? Because there, there's, you know, there was hard political messages. Well, that's the and, thing. Well, and you know, a lot of a lot we, of anger. We talk about this even. And we talk. I talk about this today. Like all this stuff about police brutality. <laughs> you know, NWA was writing about. You know, there's a reason why they put out F the police, right? Like, you know. If you listen to what people were saying, rappers were saying, none of this, everything that's going on with police brutality, you'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, like this is what they were talking about. But people were determined to get rid of the messenger, you know, let's ban this music, let's, you know, let's prevent them from playing here, let's prevent them from playing. There's so much violence at hip hop shows and blah, blah, blah. I will tell you right now that there's more violence at country music shows like you know the last big shoot up at a concert was at a country music festival in las vegas you Mm. know so are you gonna ban that like like yeah so and i was in a hip-hop band for 10 10 years that's right i saw the uh the youtube of um i'm my i'm my best lover yeah oh yes yes what a great song (laughs) huh I think like, like that is one of the most sex positive things I've ever heard in, in a world where all the incels are like no fapping. Yeah, you're well, like, that's... well, you know, and you're wearing the the sign. I love fapping. Yeah, <laughs> this is. Uh, I'd rather be masturbating. That was that was the the t shirt. Um, yeah, yeah, no, uh, we were very. Uh, I, I I try to upend images like what you perceive. So when we were you know, when I started my rap band, it was just like. I'm going to wear a skirt. You know, everyone would say, oh, that's a great kilt. I'd be like, no, it's, it's, a, it's a skirt. <laughs> I don't wear kilts. <laughs> and I would rap about how broke I was. And, um, and yeah, and I am the best lover I've ever had. And <laughs> just like, and we sampled lots of... <sighs> God, we sent, sampled Camper Van Beethoven bands like Camper Van Beethoven, Violent Femmes, like all the all the music that I would hear on college radio uh-huh. and play on college radio along with hip hop. I I wanted to sample because it's so easy to sample to take James Brown and make a a a, a funk, you know, a good a, a good hip hop song. It's easy to take a Stevie Wonder track and like I didn't want to do that. I wanted to take something that you would never expect to be, you know, to be bopping to and and turn it around and make it something really funky. So So in terms of the, just the evolution of your art and your message, were, were you at some point the Keith in in woke just trying to like get mainstream success and get syndicated, you know, on USA today and I guess kind of. I mean, what what we did in the show Here's the premise of Woke for all those who haven't seen it. Yeah. Basically, my character... Yeah, yes, yeah. Um, so it opens on my character on the verge of making it big with a very mild and milk toast um, <laughs> uh, comic strip called Toast and Butter. Like, it was... Uh, the first thing I thought about was milk toast, and then yeah. it was like, toast and butter. Like, and I thought that that was the first idea that came to my head, so I was like, okay, that, that won't be it. So, But I'll... <laughs> but it... Right. And toast and butter are are voiced by the whitest male voices you could imagine. Kinda. I mean, it it is, but one of them is black. Like it's two guys from. Um, <laughs> it's uh, uh, oh God Richardson, um, um, Tony, uh, the two guys from Veep, which is another okay. show that I really love. Um, but uh, I'm t- Tony Hill and uh, I forget the other guy's name, but. They are, I mean, they were hilarious. And, and there was a purpose to making Toast and Butter t- 2D and all the other animation, like puppetry and like real. Mm. Because 
toast and butter are just really flat and and plain and empty. And it just makes sense that the first idea that came to my head, toast and butter, became that idea and uh, the idea that we used. And I, I, I loved it because I, I enjoyed developing sort of I, – I made toast and butter comic strips and I just developed – this whole thing behind it so and i said to myself you know if this all fails the least that can happen is i i start up a toast and butter strip you know um but it was really fun working with them but so he's about to make it big with toast and butter and then he yeah he just he ends up being mistaken for a someone who's robbing people in, in the area uh, by cops so he gets profiled by the cops you know very traumatizing he gets tackled guns pointed at him and all this stuff and it jars something in him and uh so then it sort of opens up a third eye and so that third eye is basically he starts to see like an animate object uh, become animated and come to life and so these animated objects are kind of like his id telling him yeah you know yeah bust up this place like (laughs) throw this thing at the window and bust it stuff like that and we came up with that idea because i remember just saying like there's nothing more boring than a show about a cartoonist where the cartoonist is just sitting there drawing like there's nothing it's so boring so (laughs) we're like how can we incorporate animation and stuff like that to make it interesting and Mm -hmm. And to the credit of Maurice Mar- Marable, the, our director, producer, he's the one who came up with the idea of saying, I don't want to just do 2D animation. I want to do puppetry and stuff, too, which I think took it to a whole other level because yeah. he came when he when he presents when he has an idea of what he wants the show to look like. They come with a lookbook. So what that lookbook is, is all these images of of stuff he wants the show to look like. So he came with a lookbook that featured, he said, there's four movies I want this show to look like. Do the Right Thing, which is a favorite movie of mine. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which is a favorite movie of me and my wife. Sorry to Bother You, which is... Uh, uh, a friend of mine who I've played with uh, Boots Riley from The Coup and a total bonkers movie. That's, that's about the uh, call center. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh. And then um, uh, Amelie, which huh. is my wife's, one of my wife's favorite films. So it was just like, when he came with that, I was like, all right, this guy gets me. You know, this guy uh-huh. gets me. So, uh, and that really elevated the show. Anyway, so... He's basically what he's going through right now is, through season one is basically his racial awakening or I call it racial pr- puberty. <laughs> <laughs> and it, the, the, the incident that happens with the cops is based on something that happened to me. But I had been doing cartoons about police brutality and profiling for a long time. Yeah. My woke moment to me one of my biggest woke moments was when I was a junior in college because I had my first black teacher when I was a junior in college. So this is another huge thing that I have done comics about. They say that if a black student has one black teacher between kindergarten and 12th grade, their likelihood of going to college goes up like 30 to 35% just to have somebody that looks like them at the front of the class teaching them something. And I never had that. But I was lucky enough to have a substitute when I was in, in, in grade school who was black, young black man who was an aspiring cartoonist. So when we had a study class, he would invite me up beside his desk and we would doodle together. Hmm. And so seeing that guy was hmm. huge, made me say I could do it. But... Fast forward to my first black teacher, i.e. teaching a class in, in college in Salem, Salem, Massachusetts. He was an American literature teacher, and he assigned us for people to read. Ralph Ellison, James Baldwin, uh, Richard Wright, Maya Angelou. And when someone said, why are you giving us all, all black writers? He said, I'm giving you all American writers. And that 
to me was my woke moment. Oh, sorry to hit the microphone, but mm. that was when my work went from being about keg parties to being about what it's like to be black in America. Like you can just tell your story, but what I what I wanted to do was like, how is it a little di- bit different because of the color of my skin and and how I grew up and and all you know that mm. type of thing. So. So that, to me, was played a very important role. And then going to San Francisco was moving to San Francisco after college was a, uh, another huge, huge uh, moment for me. And um, I think it's because I saw the legacy of underground cartooning once I moved out there mm. and saw that you didn't have to have this little tiny daily cartoon strip. You could have a, a bigger format and you could write about drugs and sex and, and politics and all this different stuff. So my work really changed from college to San Francisco mm. and <laughs> became what it is today. So yeah. I'm realizing two things. One is my first black teacher was when I was a junior in college. Too. Oh, wow. And the second thing is this is the first time I've ever thought about that. Mm. <laughs> That's the thing. It's like, I, I think, I think white people take for granted that normal in America is white, right. and that all the books that they're going to get, that we all get, all the history is all geared towards elevating European Americans, and. The rest of us have to just even fight to be heard or seen, you know, and it's that is an ongoing uh, concern and struggle. And I was listening to some thing where they were analyzing what people, black writers were asking for 50 years ago from today and then 50 years before that. So. In 1970, and then 50 years before that, 1920, and they found that it's the same thing. Like, uh, you know, decent schools, decent neighborhoods, not to be (laughs) murdered, (laughs) you know, by police or by, you know, by vigilantes and stuff like that. And, like, just the same things. All across the board, like nothing has changed. It sounds pretty human. Like I think you can pretty much, yeah, get yeah. that list of from like that's what humans want, right? And the 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 important thing is though, like really, is to acknowledge what has come in the past and say like this is what they were complaining about then and how much Mm. progress have have we made Mm. and you know all these states are passing laws not to look at that which is not a good thing you know Mm. it's it's uh um very detrimental and um it's super important and it's not just for for people of color to, to to learn this stuff like you know, everybody should. It's part of American history. You know, the, the, the European slave trade is really European history. <laughs> it's not really black history. And so, like, that's, yeah, in, ter- in terms of agency, right? Yeah. And, and but, but I mean, and I, I say this all the time, like, you know, Obama becoming president, which I think is really what I think it made a lot of. It made a lot of white people crazy that, that a black man became president. To the in and, and so you know, it started a lot of scaring a lot of people, saying, "Well, oh, you know, the white people aren't the top of the food chain anymore. Like you're, we're going to be all knocked, wiped out." Hence the rise of all this foolishness that's going on, and you know, Obama. Becoming president is not a black accomplishment. It is a white accomplishment because there have been plenty of people of color, plenty of black people who have been qualified to become president. It's just white people could not get themselves to vote 
for anybody like that. Hmm. And so the fact that they finally came around and voted Obama in <laughs> is a white accomplishment. Huh. And so hmm. there are a lot of things that we need to look at in a, a different way. Hmm. And so I, I try to, that's what I try to do with my work is to get people to understand that a lot of the framing <laughs> again, is done by, by white people. I just watched this, The Guardian yesterday just had an article that said, uh, will Dr. Dre's halftime sh- Super Bowl concert solve NFL's race problem? <laughs> who, yeah. who, who makes the decision to do a story like that? And it's not black people. <laughs> it's not black people. But, you know, it's just, it's silly stuff like that, that it just makes me go, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't bode well for this nation as a, as, as a whole, no, which is it, kind of a downer. And any day now, Biden is going to announce his pick for the Supreme Court, and it looks like it's going to be a black woman, and a lot of white people are losing their shit about, you know... Which is... Affirmative action. Yeah, which is really interesting because, you know, Reagan said he would pick a woman. Trump said he'd pick a woman. But it's but if you put black in front of it, all of a sudden it's like, oh, oh, wait, no, oh, wait. And, I mean, that's, I guess that's his mistake. But um, uh, hopefully moving forward he can be vague <laughs> and just say, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, pick a woman and then he picks a black woman and you know they'll lose their shit when when it happens but they won't lose their shit now and so um, it's interesting it's all very interesting yeah. so i wanted to get back to the the, the puppets and cartoons who, oh. who are talking to yeah. keith yeah and you know they're really in his head it's not it's not like these are sort of measured conversations that he has control over yeah like they're you know they're the, the the sharpie is like um, pestering him, you know, when he's on stage. Yeah, and it kind of reminded me. I saw you had in, in your online store you had a, a drawing with a quote by James Baldwin. That's basically like to be to be black in America and to be conscious means you're in a sort of a constant state of rage. Yeah, and I'm like that's how I'm seeing all these, um, you know, animated objects. Yeah, kind of you know impinging on on the character keeps equanimity yeah so i mean that that's really it is is it's the voices in his head manifesting themselves in these inanimate objects all around him and it was a great way for us to have you know the stuff that they're saying if it was coming out of a human's mouth it would sound preachy and you know whatever but the fact that it's coming from these inanimate objects is kind of wacky and weird and we can get away with it. So that was really, to me, that was really fun to do. And it was really fun to figure out how the animation was going to manifest itself throughout the season. And, you know, it reminded me of, I don't know if you remember the sixth sense, but it's kind of like, you didn't know where the ghost was coming next, you know, where um, the ghosts were. So, it was really fun to figure out, okay, where where's the next time the animation is going to show up? And um, <clears throat> so that was that was neat. And then what were they going to say? What were they going to talk about? And um, and then after that, the voices that we got were so good uh, from, you know, Nicole Byer and Eddie Griffin and Cedric the Entertainer and uh, Jack McBriar from... Uh, 30 Rock, and uh, and then um, Keith David, who did the Bible, which was really like his... We just wanted him to talk because his voice sounds so good. <laughs> and then Cree Summer, who um, is a huge, um, like a classic voiceover person, but she was on uh, A Different World. I had a crush on her uh, on A Different World when I was, you know, way back when, 50,000 years ago. <laughs> It's cool. Did so, you tell her about it? I did. No, you know, unfortunately, all that stuff was done over Zoom because we finished shooting the season one a week before they shut everything down. 
we are known as one of, the, I think, maybe the last production that got finished before the first big COVID thing. So it was crazy. It was crazy. Wow. We were so lucky. So some some of the the recurring jokes, which are sort of, which are hilarious, are also like painful. Like if they weren't, if you didn't make a joke out of them, there's like, you know, I think it's Gunther is the. The, the roommate selling cocaine as an energy drink. Oh, and, yeah. And, like, yeah. you know, and he's he's featured, like, really getting in the cop's face, like, as an ally, and yet it's clear, like, they're, like, if it was a black guy doing what he was doing, they'd be dead. That is really, like, the most straight from my life experience is when that ha- when it happened with me with the police. It wasn't so... Uh, it wasn't so dramatic. I didn't get thrown down or anything, but I was hanging up posters and a, a cop showed up and came out and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm hanging up posters and this is a staple. I'm going to put it down. And he says, you know, we have the suspect. So he calls all these cops and cops start driving from all different uh, perspective, all different streets showing up. And um, my roommate, I had a white roommate who was on a bus who had turned the corner up at the top and he saw he said he saw all these cop cars down at the bottom of the hill and he was like where, where was this the san francisco uh-huh. and he said oh, all right sfpd hassling another black man and then he as he got closer he realized oh my god like that's my roommate <laughs> just like and he got off the bus and little white guy and he came running across the street like screaming bloody hell like getting up in their face and they all turned around and saw this guy running at them like with this totally angry look on his face and they didn't do anything they just were like take it easy man calm down he was like "Ah." and i said that is like if i don't know where it's gonna end up but like that is an image that is seared into my brain Mm. and um so it was so uh, Mo did such a great job. Maurice uh, Marable did such a great job on that that scene because it's done in a way that is quick, but everybody gets it. Everybody sees it and knows knows that part, and that's great. And I also got the sense that you know that the, the, your character on the ground is really wishing your roommate would not do this because it's kind of escalate, like it's making it more dangerous for you. Just having anger, like you appreciate the gesture, but like stop. But also, he, you know, like I got the impression that like he was concerned for Gunther that like something might happen to him. You know, like okay. we purposely made my character more naive than I would be uh-huh. because we want the audience to go on that journey yeah. with him. So, uh, so. There's a reason why, like, all this is just dawning on him, you know? And uh, we could say he's been coddled all his life as the chosen one. As uh, And in and, and many ways, I, I sort of got that, um, you know, when chaos was going on in my cafeteria or something, and I'd be sitting there drawing, like... People would be like, "Don't mess with him. He's 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 the artist." <laughs> like, you know, it's just that type of thing. So it's gotten me out of a lot of uh, a lot of stuff. So in a way, I, you know, I I am rather innocent, but uh, but not as innocent as he is, and mm. whatever in his thirties or something. Right. And you know, your um, your black roommate Clovis is kind of you know the the jaded realistic one right like there's there's a scene at the beginning where they find a a white woman's wallet on the ground and clovis like do not touch that there's no yeah there's no way in which this ends well for you and he throws it throws it away and i will say that when i wrote that scene that's when i was like oh i can write television because um it's a way of telling you what who the characters are not by saying oh you're the one who's blah 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 and you're the one who's blah 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 but by their actions so you know finding this wallet and him wanting to go to the cops and and Clovis being like no way are you crazy like 
those two things where you're able to know who these characters are without them being blatantly described to you. And uh, so uh, that scene, not only did I love, like, when I finished that scene, I was like, oh, I can write television. But that scene was uh, T. Murph, the guy who plays Clovis, his first big scene and sort of the test as to, because this was his first major role. And um, (laughs) during the reading, you you do a, a reading in front of all the executives um, before we leave to go and shoot. And he was so nervous that he started improv and like going way off script and, and just <laughs> totally like everyone's like, oh, no. <laughs> and to his credit, he went and um, worked with his act- acting coach and all this stuff and just like and and then so that night when they were we were about to do that scene everyone was just like holding their breath and he just knocked it out of the ballpark and it's just like yeah we have a show you know it's just really really good and what's really interesting is we shot that scene in Vancouver in Vancouver's Chinatown which looks like the Richmond district in in San Francisco and it's a show it's a street called Kiefer Street so it was shot on Kiefer Street and the 22 bus came by, and it's the night bus. So it was K and I G H T coming by. Huh. It was, yeah, it was so weird. Like we were just like, this is destiny. It's really <laughs> wild. So mm-hmm. weird things happen. So I'm curious about the the dynamic on set because you're presenting material, and I'm guessing, you know, the the black actors have experienced that. Like, yeah, this is life. And I'm wondering for the for the white actors who are participating who may not have been in a a black centered show before, like is there a discussion? Like is this, does this happen? Is this re- like I, I think it's more uh I think it was more the crew. I think uh you know, some of the crew and and especially in Canada, you know, we had a majority white crew that were like, you know, what is this? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know. Or but I mean, they, but they were really, you know, most most were really great. But there were a couple of people that um, that <laughs> I guess, um, you know, there's some there's there's some n words thrown around in the show, and and I think you know one of the guys on set was you know flinging it around one of the white dudes, and he was asked not to do that. He was like, why, why they're saying it, why, why, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> but uh, but. Overall, it was a great experience up there. But no, it's. Um, I think more than anything, it's it's interesting the dynamic. Again, going back to uh, white executives that may not get everything. Um, we had, gr- but you know, I'll say this: our guys at Hulu were great. But there were sometimes uh, some of the. <coughs> requests from higher ups were like um you know at the end of the pilot the first episode when he gets mugged by uh the black dude they're like so why is it so why isn't it it more menacing they said like why isn't it and i said well the point is that like his experience with the cops is supposed to be more menacing than him getting mugged by some black dude and there was this you know they said can we make him like just a little more scary can can he have a gun can he have this and I really didn't want I said like I said I I, he originally was just going to be like this Uh because I never wanted to show any gun but then they so I compromised and he lifted up and there was a gun there but um but you know when I I've and this is the thing of compromise the 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 whole issue of compromise yeah because I went in saying I don't want any black people shooting guns. I don't want any black people dressed up as women unless, unless that's, you know, unless they're trans or, you know, like I don't want it done in comedic stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't, a bunch of other things, but the, the just certain things that I just didn't want that you see in, in all this different stuff. And, um, you know, and, 
But the the acting in that scene was remarkable. Given now understand now knowing what you've just told me about your reluctance to it, like there's a bond between them of a of, of kind of understanding. Like when he lifts and shows the gun, it's not like it, 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 I didn't read it as I'm gonna. I'm this is a threat. But it's like. Look, here's my uniform. This is how we're. This is the. This is the roles we're playing. Here. Yeah, yeah. Like and he hugs him at to keep. Yeah, to keep. Well, yeah, he's hugging him to just check to see if he has any. Any. But that was a really good improv scene because, um, <laughs> just it was just weird and funny. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, the experience is is supposed to, just be, not scary. Yeah. And I mean, and, they've they've bonded over the fact that. Your character was the one mistaken for this guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, originally he was supposed to be a fan of Toast and Butter and be like, hey, can I, you know, he was going to take a picture with this phone he just stole. Can, can I get a <laughs> selfie? But they, it, it, it was going to be a lot more slapsticky, but we sort of kind of got it. Um, I, I, when I first got involved in it, I was like, listen, I know everybody wants it to be a dramedy, but... All the dramedies I see are never funny. They're like, they call it a dramedy, but it's like super serious. And just, I said, I just want to be the funniest dramedy out there, right? And and so I didn't want to sacrifice any of the comedy. But I then realized after watching different comedies and stuff and seeing if you don't have any a little bit of drama in it you don't care for the characters so you might laugh but at the end it's kind of like i don't know like fast food it's like it's gone no mm-hmm. stakes. yeah no stakes and so um so i get that the drama makes you care for the character and it was super important i think lamorne had so much goodwill coming in from new girl that to see you know winston on the ground with cops, like horrified people, you know. Mm. So, um, I think that that was really, really good. And he he just does a great job carrying the whole emotional aspect. He got so much to do in that show and that season. Um, you know, the teaser for season two is, frankly, you know, everybody loves all the other characters too. So, so like, we're giving them. Uh, more uh and so it's it's gonna be uh a combination of you know it really is it the the story expands and involves uh more than just keith in his head like by this time i i will say in season two he's he's had therapy so (laughs) (laughs) so he's dealing with it a little bit a little bit better but uh in season two it's sort of like this is post george floyd like just post George Floyd, where suddenly everybody's woke, right? And so, what happens when woke becomes the thing, the brand? You know, so it's sort of season two is like the commodification of woke, mm-hmm. and sort of what happens when you know Keith becomes sort of this semi celebrity, you know, and sort of the poison that 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 is you know so i was gonna ask about the because it it didn't occur to me that you created the name of the show before george floyd oh yeah like what what, you know at some point like i missed it like woke was a compliment and Uh, then and then all of a sudden it was an insult yeah i don't think it was ever a compliment like but back in the day it was like stay woke like you know just like (laughs) Like but, you know, if they're like, "Oh, that guy's woke," like, but that yeah, was a good thing. At some point, yeah, it, it's gotten co-opted and become just pejorative. But I, I actually, you know, it was happening while we were shooting season one. They were like, half the people hated the name, half the people loved the name, and I was. They said, "Do you mind if we change the name?" I was like, "Listen, I, I, I don't mind, um, but it's just got to be a better name." And so <laughs> everybody pitched. All their stuff. I think I pitched for Keith's sake. Um, I pitched the Gray Area um, as a play on Bay Area. Um, what else did I pitch? I don't know. I pitched a bunch of the K Chronicles, which is you know based on my comic, uh, but the nightlife. Um, but we they hired some 
firm to come up with a new name. And they tested it all, and they said, it's nothing <laughs> better than woke, you know, for better or for worse. And, mm. you know, it will be debated until time goes. But every time I see it out there, every time even – you know, when people say, oh, Hulu's too woke or this and that, like, I think we should lean into it. Like, I'm trying to get the promotion for this season to be like, um, I have this whole thing. Like, do you find yourself wondering if the person giving you a lap dance has decent health care? <laughs> then you should be, you might be suffering from secondhand woke, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and entitled to uh, compensation. You know, stuff like that. Like, just... <laughs> lean into it and just I mean it, it every everything has an opportunity to make you laugh and to be made fun of and it's just like let's just do it like I can't sit there and, and spend time on oh should we have called it another name should we have done you know it's like well I mean the other thing that, that came to me is that you know that People are criticized for being woke like it's a choice. Like, oh, you've decided to, to have this set of views. And the way it's portrayed in the show, it's, it's, it's an awakening. You can't go back to, he can't go back to sleep. Yeah. Like, woke, woke is not something that he chose. It's something that happened to him. Yeah. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Oh, you know what? I might use that, actually, because we wrote that down uh, in, in the first season. But, but it's true. It's like once you see it, you can't unsee it. And what I love about the name too is that to this day people are discovering the show because they dismissed it because of the name they dismiss it and then they run out of things to watch <laughs> and then they say all right I'll, uh, and they watch like an episode and they're like oh this is actually funny like they they expect that it's just going to be something that's going to yeah, preach goes, to them it goes down easily yeah yeah exactly and it's uh and they you know it actually makes fun of the woke movement and and that's oh, sorry it criticizes sort of the idea of some of these silly aspects of like um you know the idea of okay let's not call the master bedroom master we're going to stop using you know Make it so I can get a loan just as easy as a white person. I don't care. You can call it master bedroom. You, you can call it master bathroom. I don't care. Just can I get a loan? That, that's it. Like those are the things that the real changes, not the cosmetic changes, the performative stuff that drives me crazy. And that's the stuff that we hopefully make fun of. So, right. yeah. yeah. I had one more, one more question, which is how, how I found out about you from y'all telling me about um, black mugshots. Ah, yeah. Um, it's really interesting um, because it's something I've always wanted to do. I was sitting there going, and and it was always in the back of my head. Like, so uh, just describe it. For, oh, Black for Mugshots uh, is is a project that um, I, I've basically gotten black people to take a selfie of themselves with their favorite hot beverage with a mug, and then. Anybody who's not black has to have a black mug. So it fits the black mug shot idea. And it's an answer to the idea of the pro pro proliferation of mug shots. Like if you look at any like Google News or any aggregate news thing, the most thing you see of black people are mug shots, mug shots, mug shots. And the thing about mug shots is these are only suspects like – all these mugshots are generally suspects and there's never any follow up. You know, they could be innocent. They could be the wrong person. They could be, there's never any, but you have that image seared into your head. And I just found out Ireland has outlawed mugshots because, because of that very fact that you demonize people when you see them in a mugshot and you can't get it off the internet. Like there are, companies that claim they'll cl scrub your the internet of your mug shop but you can't do that you can't do mm -hmm. that so for me it started out as like let's screw with the algorithm let's see how long it would take to end up in the google image search with my picture in a mug with a mug shot amongst all these you know <laughs> mug shots and it took about a month and a half um but um 
But once people heard about it, they were just psyched to do it. And so people started sending me all these mug shots from all over the world. And we have, we're rolling up on 600 mug shots right now. I, I bought this, I bought the website Black Mug Shots. And, uh, and, and so now the goal is to get more than just my picture on the Google image search because it's always my picture. But, um, but it's it's really neat, you know. Lamorne uh, gave us a mugshot, and um, there's a few others. The guy who played the Mandalorian, um, uh, he didn't give us a mugshot, but <laughs> it was just out there with him with the black mug. So we're like, oh, let's just add it on there. <laughs> but it's Disney, you know. Disney owned Tulu; they shouldn't get mad at me. But um, but all this other, all these other folks, like writer, like it. it to me, when I look at it. It's all these cartoonists. There's all these musicians I played with. There's people I went to high school with, people I went to college with, people who live here in Carborough, people who lived in L.A. It's like it's it's like this is your life when I look at my uh, thing. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and what's what's the like the activist part of this? Other, other than you know, it's not... well, it, it, it's it's to shed light and hopefully. With the, you know, Washington Post did a story on it, and uh, I think Boston.com did a story on it. A couple of other places have, and they, they're syndicated to a bunch of different media uh, places. And the point I want to make is media companies should stop relying on mugshots. Like, and they're, they're, after George Floyd, there were all these articles saying that a lot of places would stop using mugshots mm-hmm. because and specifically mugshots means if so, someone's been stopped by the police or arrested, they take a very unflattering photo next yeah. to next to a with the with the numbers there or just a black and white photo and the, and, and and just yeah it's yeah. never yeah it's it's yeah. very humili- humiliating and if if you go for a job if you go for uh you know a place to live you go for anything and people employers look at your social media immediately now like for when you go for a job and if your if your mugshot comes up it doesn't matter what you explain to them like they're mm-hmm. they're gonna think even if you're innocent like why would you get arrested you know and um, what was the statistic they say something like Black folks are 40% uh, the total of what cops bring in, but they're 84% of their mug shots are in pictures. So it's like every, you know, it's, it's just, Mm -hmm. so we're using the site for people to go to and like the next version of it, we're listing organizations for like, I want to end cash bail, like, we should end cash bail because basically it just keeps, keeps poor people in jail. Um, you know, prison justice reform, the Innocence Project. These, there's going to be all these links to different places that people can sort of look into these issues and say, all right, like maybe this is something I can help out with. Um, the book, uh, the Pri- Books for Prisoners Project. That's something that I like to do every year is donate books to, to prisoners and and. Just do whatever I can to sort of, uh, I don't know, help make the world a better place. You are one of the rare people in the world who have a show where you are, you, there is a main character that is you. And that is like a one in a bajillion chance of like having a TV show about your life. So with that being said... If if the sky's the limit and anything's possible, what do you want in the next twenty years to happen to you? That's fucking awesome. That just <laughs> that you that you know like now that you have a show that's about you and like is you know your baby and whatever like what what is possible for you? What like if you just dream manifest right now? Like what's the coolest next three big things that you either want to accomplish or like just happen to you or like crazy just yeah that's my idea that's my question um well i mean you know i would love to be sort of somebody that creates opportunity for the next person like me you know so i would love to have one of these crazy deals where they're like 
Netflix signs blah 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 to a production deal where it's just like first look, you know, and you can just come um, with because I have a, a bunch of different projects that um, I, I would love to to do uh-huh. um, and produce, and and not just you know some are I want to be really involved in some I just want to be back uh, and, and not do a whole lot with, but the other thing is you know I want to um, I love food. And uh, <laughs> I want to have a show very, you know, like Anthony Bourdain. Like, I, like, yeah. like that is like, I, I, you know, I love rolling into a town. I, w- I want to roll into a town and just meet with a few cool people, talk about sort of the historical aspect of whatever's going on in the town and how it relates to food and then just have a great meal, you know. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, and um, so that's like I would love to do that. Um, that's sort of a, a fantasy thing. Like, what is what better? I mean, traveling, learning, and eating. Like those are <laughs> that's, that's it. Those are the three things that like I would love to be able to do. And um, but uh, you know, everything else is just like I just want to see my. You know, I guess provide like I, I want to see my my family's dreams sort of come together. So, yeah, my son wants to play baseball. He wants to play major league baseball, and you know, he's he's well on his way. He's playing for a travel team, and just like just really talented and and amazing. And so it's just those things. Uh, um, it, Obviously, I would love to see sort of, you know, massive reform. I, I, but I, I would love to see the educational system. You know, again, we have to. Get, America is going through its darkest time in a, in a really long time. In recent history. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> it's pretty. Dark and it's going to continue to get really ugly, and then at some point, it's got to. It's hopefully hits rock bottom and then comes comes back up and you know this this educational system that we have that where people are suddenly like i don't know someone put it best like you know if you are more concerned about banning books than banning guns you know in in classrooms then i think your priorities are mixed up you know and uh and just the idea of it's kids that kids want to learn like they it's it's the parents that are like uh, you know i almost think like the parents are worried that their kids are going to see their grandparents in some picture screaming at some little black girl trying to get into school you know <laughs> so um it's, maybe, maybe we could pixelate all the white faces in those pictures there you go there you go um <laughs> compromise oh god it's just it's just really interesting but like that's the type of stuff i really want to explore like if we can get a third season you know it's it'd be really interesting to go down that road and just um i don't know i remember going to visit san francisco juvenile hall and they asked me to come there because my book was the most stolen book out of the (laughs) prison library (laughs) and i was like oh that's kind of cool like there are so many different things that have happened that I was like, oh, yeah, man, that would be great to get that into the show or this into the show. And um, so, I don't know. I, I guess it's just I have always considered myself extremely fortunate, you know, always. When living in San Francisco and I just remember just being like, this is like, where I want to be, and this, you know, this was when San, when San Francisco was inexpensive. Yeah. Listen, the best time to go to San Francisco is right after a big earthquake. So the next time there's a huge earthquake, it's going to scare most people away. It's going to be plenty of vacancies, and you get in there now. So, um, but I don't know. And just, I'd say, don't be afraid to fail. Like that's the other thing. Is like, you know, any advice that I'm about to speak to my hopefully in person uh speak to my school i'm i'm doing commencement at salem state university's um this graduation in may 
Let's just be like, don't be afraid to fail, you know? It's just like, I think that's probably the thing that prevented me from accomplishing this stuff earlier on is, you know, my goal was to go to San Francisco for five years and then go down to L.A. and try to make a television show. I stayed in San Francisco for 16 years because it was wonderful and amazing. But, you know, I probably got comfortable, too. And mm. and I realized that at <laughs> after 16 years, I was just like, okay, I'm really comfortable right here. And I don't want to be... 20 years from now be like the bitter angry guy that was saying oh San Francisco used to be cool but now it's blah 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 so so I got out went to LA and then you know right before the show happened I didn't know the show was going to happen but we left LA and everyone was saying don't leave (laughs) <laughs> don't leave. You don't know when your your thing is going to come in. And I said, yeah, but I don't want to be here like 20 years down the line. Saying, I stayed because I thought it was. And so I, I came here and I think my producers were shocked that I left. They're like, oh, my God, he really left. So they I think they it put a fire under their asses to say, well, we got to we got to make a show so we can get him back here. Um, but I told him I'm not going to move back to L.A. Like it's, I don't think it's a, a great place to raise a family unless you're like – I don't even think if you're super rich because then you just hang out with super rich spoiled brats. So, um, you know, it was really great to move here. And everybody now says, oh, man, you did the right thing. You got out, man. Like <laughs> – everything's a cesspool and expensive and blah 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 you know so um yeah so it's it's cool but that's a very long answer i mean but you you heard what i said like yeah it's i i know how lucky i am and i've always i've always considered myself like that i was always a lucky person you know um not luck in the sense that i'd win the lottery but the lucky twin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm not the smart twin. I'm the lucky twin. <laughs> that might be Lucky Twin Productions. That might be the name of my production hey, company. <laughs> That's I it. also thought of a name for your. Uh, I thought of a name for your Stanley Tucci uh, cooking show. Come on, you got it. If he goes, if he goes and hangs out with Stanley Tucci and they cook together, it could be called Big Night. Big Night. Well. I actually have a title for that. My I, my title would be Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, okay. which I've had for a long time. But since uh, Sidney Poitier passed, it means even you know more a little homage to him. So, but yeah, it's and and one of the things I always wanted to do was like I want somebody's mom or grandmom to cook because they always do something better than hmm. any restaurant. So. The show should always end with eating at somebody's mom's or grandma's house. You know, so nice. That's my thing. Nice. So, for people who want to know more about you, find your work, uh, buy stuff. Where, uh, where do they go? Um, KeithKnightArt dot com. So Keith Knight K N I G H T Knight is in Knight in shining armor. KeithKnightArt dot com will get you to books and. Uh, original art and prints and stuff like that. Um, if you want to subscribe to my work, my latest work, Patreon. Uh, I have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash Keith Knight, K-E-E-F-K-N-I-G-H-T. I know that's confusing. But, uh, and then my old school site, kchronicles.com is like, it's so old that Anybody who's like under forty is like, oh wow, you get that cool retro site. Yeah. I said, no, it's it's the same site. <laughs> yeah, it, it looked very two thousand three. Oh, it's it's. I think it's older than that. But uh, but but, you, but you, keep, you keep it up to date. It has you know. Re- yeah, yeah. You know, I think I update it like once a month. But um, it's yeah, like I do everything myself when I shouldn't. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, there's so many things I should be doing having someone else work on but I don't know it's DIY that's what I I grew up on doing DIY DIY or die (laughs) so cool and also shows called Woke on Hulu Woke April 8th Mm -hmm. yeah 4-8 
and uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. It's uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what they go with. I hope they go with the. Uh, I don't. I, whatever's best. Whatever they come up with is poster. The poster is best. But uh, my kid's gonna make. I'm gonna write out like have them send a check so it's all official. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So and well, I'll just I'll just tell people this is not like you know watching. You need to do like for a class. This is fun. This is this is binge worthy television. It's like eating dessert that has wisdom and... Yeah, it's like all my comics. I hope you laugh, but, you know, the first priority is to make you laugh, but the second thing is to make you think. Hopefully it'll make you think. The best of my comics do that. They make you laugh and also make you think. Awesome. Well, Keith Knight, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. It's been lovely sitting out here and... Thanks to Elle for arranging like it. And 30 for, million questions that maybe we can ask for part two. Maybe, 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 maybe you should start a podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> you should. I, I love the idea of podcasts. Like, and it's such a perfect, um, I don't know, just it's, I love conversation. I've, I love the idea of just chatting and, and, I, and, just chatting about different issues and stuff and not like I, I I've often talked to my 13 year old like we should start a because that community radio station I was like we should do a show and you know we can just talk about I don't know local stuff and you guys can talk about it too you know it'd be really fun to talk about have the boys have on. Them on next time <laughs> yeah well it's so funny because the 13-year-old's talk, you know, he talks like a 13-year-old and he keeps on they're homeschooled, so they're all around they're around each other all the time. So, oh. you know, he's saying a lot more dirty stuff. I'm like, <laughs> your brother's going to say this to one of the other kids in the neighborhood, say, uh, you know, and it's just like you don't want that to happen. So, please don't <laughs> do that. But it's interesting. Um, advice as a homeschooler, as someone who's been, um, through it. Um, and this was from, I guess, both of you, like, what would you say is something, you know, like the three most positive aspects of your experience and, and what you did? Um, well, for me, the most positive is like the absence of a kind of conformity. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I, yeah. I would. I mean, there, I I've had a couple of. This is a different podcast now when I'm into it. Uh, like, I dropped out because I was so passionate about drawing and about making art and about learning about art that I would like dr- like sneak out of like American history class, which was completely fairy tale inaccurate class, yes. fairy tale class. <laughs> may i add <laughs> like and then the native americans just kind of did their own thing and kind of just pieced out i'm like yeah. no they didn't so yeah. i ended up just like and i you dropped went to a pretty progressive school too. i did we won't name names <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, i'm sure i've spoken uh, that progressive school. i'm sure you have <laughs> but uh i just in that moment in that time in that class i had just lived in South Africa for the past nine months and I was just having a lot of trouble readjusting to being treated like a kid Mm -hmm. and not just like treated like a person and so I dropped out so that I could like draw as much as I wanted and like learn as much as I wanted so I would say I dropped out of school so that I could keep learning (laughs) yeah you know so wow that's a great quote I dropped out of school so I could keep on learning and I have (laughs) I've gotten so much joy out of learning my time from 10th grade to 12th grade I don't think I learned anything I think Mm -hmm. that one animal farm experience was the only thing that I got out of it it's Mm -hmm. like it just became just social thing and that was it it's like you just stop learning and it becomes i don't know just it was it was yeah it was not a good a good experience and and yeah the whole history thing that's a huge priority to me is i want my kids to know uh what i know uh, much earlier and um and i think i think that's what happens with 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 black and brown people is like we have to spend after we get out of this school we have to spend the rest of our our adulthood 
on learning mm-hmm. and like learning how the system works. Like there's this whole. Why do we have to learn about the French and Indian War four times? Really? Like really? There's not, no other remarkable history has taken place. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, learn about. I mean, uh, you know, the things that why why do why are all the black neighborhoods you know in the worst part of town you know near septic tanks near uh there are less trees there are less off by the highway yeah yeah exactly Mm -hmm. like those are the type of things we're not we're not allowed to talk about that anymore that's crt yeah yeah no (laughs) yeah i mean one, we never talked about it, which is they're banning something that isn't even taught in school. But now, like, yeah, now if you say anything about it, it's just like you're going to get in trouble. So, I don't know. I just feel like um, there's an opportunity here. There's an opportunity for <laughs> some, I mean, maybe that's that's the thing I do is create a, a, a series of schools like that are like here. Learn the stuff that they don't want you to teach, you know? Yeah. Um, Unschooling curriculum. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, unschool yourself. Um, But, yeah, it's it's all very interesting. But I like like that, though. Um, And that's what we do is a combination of unschooling and homeschooling. And and, and they lean into sort of the stuff that they're really into. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, my nine-year-old's playing guitar right now, and yeah, my thirteen-year-old. I mean, is so into baseball, and you're able to teach so many things like percentages and and a lot of number stuff with baseball. But yeah, um, yeah, but yeah, also just just the idea of just learning the business aspect of it, and also the history of it. Um. And this is something I talk about, too, that Jackie Robinson was not the first black baseball player. Like, they had black ball players in, in the late 1800s, but it was a gentleman's agreement that happened after Reconstruction that, like, you know, all the black codes and all the segregationist laws that, that came after, um, that prevented black people from playing until Jackie Robinson. So, Another white accomplishment, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, there's so much, there's so much to talk about. And yeah, the other thing that I thought was very important and challenging about homeschooling was I had to develop trust in my children. Yeah, that you know there was a way that when they were in school I could sort of outsource that. Like, okay, this is the system that's kind of works that's going to take care of them. And when when they didn't want to do anything or they didn't want to read, or something, like to trust that. There's something innately good about human nature, as expressed in these two. Yeah. That that I I don't have to worry. Like they're they're not going to spend their lives playing video games and. So well, so we got to get there with with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, so did, so did we. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Some days to the Sims. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's funny because we we barely let them play it <coughs> at all, and. Uh, I know there are so many people that pay, play a lot more than they do. So, um, but to, to yeah, to me, it's just like for me, racial literacy, media literacy, and financial literacy. Those three mm-hmm. are things that I feel like uh, I want to. I want them that the stuff that I that they don't teach in school, and and that I think is very important. You know. Why, you know, and, and they, they have a great in, introduction to media literacy because they've been to the set. They've seen like. Oh, my gosh. What a yeah. cool, what yeah. a cool homeschooling experience. And they see like they've been there when I get like audition tapes. They've been there. And it's like I here's the you know, they think, you know, there's way too many swears. <laughs> <laughs> but they just see all the different stuff. And um you know, the effects and stuff like, you know, I say, well, the, you know, the cops, the guns that the cops have are clearly fake. But, you know, this is stuff that I didn't even know that like in the fantasy sequence in episode eight, when when he's getting shot all the different ways when they're imagining what mm-hmm. would happen to Keith if something goes bad. 
it's just all the effects that they add on, like that these little smoke effects and mm-hmm. these these lighting effects and stuff. And, you know, they don't really use uh, um, the things they used to use before that mm. would. Did be... you did you have an armorer on set? Like I'm I'm thinking about this now because of you know Alec Baldwin and Rust. Oh no, this I mean a, again like none of this stuff. None of them had bullets in it. None of them had the fake stuff. I forget what that's called, but no, they just they didn't do anything. Nothing came out of them. So uh, no, no. Mm. I mean, one of the new things is like the intimacy coordinator, mm. which I think is super important. Yeah, and um, so uh, that's you know that's interesting. The way they take the way sound is added to a scene is really interesting because it'll take ambient sound for a room or outside or uh, and like all this subtle stuff and then they'll the way they fool with the light the lighting and the colors in a picture in the scene like if you look at season one like the colors are really beautiful and 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 like really Mm -hmm. and and a lot of that stuff is i don't know if it's added but it's it's really adjusted and it re- looks really beautiful, and, and Mo spent a lot of time working on that. And then, if you shoot something like this, you have to get an okay for you have to get a, an okay for all the artists who do all this work behind you. And if you don't, like we thought, someone had gotten this okay. We shot this thing where there was all this graffiti, mm-hmm. and apparently they didn't get the okay. So we had to like. There's a scene where they're buying the shoes. And it's all CG. It's all like all the graffiti oh, on the walls. Yeah. yeah. So it's like <laughs> 50 grand. Like it's crazy. Just, but it's like you license the wrong song. Like, uh-oh. Oh, <laughs> no. $50,000 later. Well, no, no. I mean, that we had great people do that. And I, I loved working with them. In fact, it was Issa Rae, her, her company called Radio. Um, they, it's a great company. And they just were really great at getting all the right I mean the, the presenting all this great music and stuff like that and you know there's some stuff that we had to have that there was just no better song for it like Bill Withers A Lovely Day like that's like yeah it's it's one of my favorite songs uh, Public Enemy another one is my favorite song one of my favorite songs when he throws you know the homage to Spike Lee when he throws the, uh, the garbage trash, can. yeah garbage <laughs> can that in fact that scene was like that was I said when I'm when I was pitching the show, I was like, "Listen, you know, all I want to do is have a scene where my character picks up a thing and throws it, and it just doesn't work. It doesn't break. And and so if I get that scene, I'll be happy. So um, it's yeah, it's fun to see that stuff come to life, and you just you just say, "Wow, this is great." And I I, I had that moment, uh, you know, about the young ones because I remember being in high school and just being like. I want to make a show like this, you know? And so I didn't, it, it didn't flash back to me until they were doing some puppetry on the set. And I was like, Oh my God, this is it. Like I'm doing it. I'm doing it. You know? So yes. are you, are you going to make any cameos? Yeah. I was actually going to ask him that. Are you in a cameo? Or are you yes, I do. I, yes, I do. <laughs> I'll do one every season, every season we get. So yeah, I'm definitely in it. So awesome. I'm I'm in it in a much better like the last last year I was the uh, koala that punches my character so <laughs> you have no idea but you can almost kind of see it's me in, in this in this new one so yeah we'll see cool well thank you so much I've just adored this conversation uh, excellent no yeah it's a, a, a pleasure and uh, you know let's uh, let's do it again. And hopefully we'll have a, a a reason to. Awesome. Well, maybe we should get the kids together and have them drop wisdom. I think she'll be dropping the wisdom, and and oh, my thirteen wow. year old will be dropping, <laughs> you know, dirty words and laughing. <laughs> no, I will say I remember we were at at I think Target, and they had something where you donate money, you know, at the end. And he's like, "That's exactly what he said." He said, <laughs> "So, so we're supposed to give them money." <laughs> And then they donate it, and and 
and you know it, they get the credit for it. And, uh, and I was like, <laughs> right, yeah, that's a homeschooler right, right. there. Excellent. <laughs> right, racial and and financial literacy. There you go. Check, Check it up. All right, and that's a wrap. Boy, that was fun. Boy, I want to do more of those. I'm curious to hear from you, and you can talk back at plantyourself.com slash talk. Uh, just go to any web browser. If you have a microphone, you can share up to five minutes. Um, um, this is getting a little bit far away from the original um, process of this show, which was just about plant-based, about you know, cookbook authors and doctors, um, you know, and I'm expanding what I'm interested in and what I think is important about, you know, a healthy planet. And I'm curious, I'd love to talk to more artists and creators about the stuff that they're working on that may not be entirely plant adjacent. And, you know, Keith didn't talk about like what kinds of food he wants to uh, experience on this uh, travelogue, Anthony Bourdain like cooking show, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be all you know, broccoli and cauliflower. Um, what do you think? You know, or would you go on this journey with me if I'm expanding and talking to more creatives about the work that they're doing in the world? Because it sure is fun to talk to, you know, people whose living is, you know, mined from their imaginations. And it certainly helps me, um, you know, be more imaginative in the work that I'm doing in the world. So again, plantyourself.com slash talk. Let me know what you think. Okay, show notes for today's episode, along with the photos, as I said, that my daughter Yael took, which you can find at plantyourself.com slash 504, along with links to Keith's work and um, the show on Hulu. And what else is going on? Uh, movement news. Boy, it's a beautiful day today. Might get up into the mid 50s and sunny. And it looks like it's going to be that way for a while. So I'm expecting to do some sprinting and then ultimate on Saturday, kind of get up the get the cardio back up after a winter of honestly relative uh, ease and sloth. Garden news, not much going on now except, you know, pouring through seed catalogs and starting to prepare the spring planting. All right, time for thanks. Thanks to Will Ridenauer for allowing me to use his beautiful song, Sabali Dawn, The Dance of Peace. You can find more of Will's music at his website, willridenauer.com. And of course, thanks to all of you Plant Yourself podcast patrons. Kim Harrison, Lynn McClellan, Brittany Porter, Dominic Maurer, Barbara Whitney, Tammy Black, Amy Good, Amanda Hatherley, Mary Jane Wheeler, Ellen Kennelly, Melissa Cobb, Rachel Behrens, Tina Scharf, Tina Ahern, Jen Filkonofsky, David Bizek, The Mysterious, Michelle X, Elspeth Feldman, Leah Stoller, Alan Christensen, Colleen Peck, Michelle Landry, Josina, Sarah Durkis, Kelly Cameron, Janet Selby, Claire Adams, Tom Franz, Jeanette Benham, Gil Sarah David Donahue, Blair Cyber, Dorona Vizov, Gio and Carolyn Argentati, Jody Friesner, Misha Rosen, Michael Warbeck, Aviva Lael, Alicia Lemus, Val Lineman, Nick Harper, Banda Nachali, Molly Levine, The Inscrutable, Harry R., Susan Laverty, The Panda Vegan, Craig Kovic, Adam Scharf, Karen Burry, Heather Morgan, Nigel Davies, Marion Blum, Teresa Copel, Julian Watkins, Breed O'Connell, Sharon Hirschman, Linda Ayad, Holm Hedegaard, Isa Tuzinwa, Connie Hainline, Aaron Greer, Alicia Davis, Heather O'Connor, Carolyn Jensen, Sherry Olikoski of Plant Power for Health, Karen Smith, Scott McRonnie, Karen and Joe Crabtree, Kirby Burton, Teresa Carell, Kevin McCauley, Elizabeth Rothschild, Ann Jesse, Cheryl Dwyer, Jenny Hazelton, Peter W. Evans, Dennis Bird, Darby Kelly, Lori Fanny, Linnea Lundquist, Emily Iconelli, Levy Wallach, Rosamund McAtee, Dan Picorni, Stephen Leenan, Patty DiMartino, Mike and Donna Kartz, Deanne Bishop, Bill Burry Elf, Marjorie Lewis, Trisha Adams, Nancy Sheldon, Lindsay Bayshore, Gunmarie Hagen, Tracy Gulledge, Laura Heaton, Meg from Mama Says, Stacey Stokes, Ben Savage, Michael Kay, David Hughes, Connie Rogers, Claire England, Sally Robertson, Parham Ganchi. Amy Daly, Brian Tourville, Mark Jeffrey Johnson, Josie Dempsey, Karen Schmidt, Pamela Hayden, Emily Perryman, Allison Corbett, Richard Stone, Lauren Vaught of Edible Musings, Aaron Hasty, Sean Owen, Sagar Nayak, Erica Piedra, Danielle Roberts, Michael Lushton, Sarah Johnson, Catherine Floyd, for your generous support of the podcast. That's it for now. As always, be well, my friends. 